uh, and also well known as the executive director of the Thurgood Marshall Center for Civil Rights. Um, and so thank you so much to um, Professor Miller for bringing this group together and for um, uh, having this, bringing this conversation to us. And, and thanks, thank you again to, to our, our um, esteemed um, guests and, um, and this, uh, this program. Um, is the first under, um, uh, under the launching of our Loyola Anti-Racism Center. So, um, so that's quite exciting for us as well. Um, and I'm gonna let Professor Miller now take it away. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Professor Kim. Um, the panelists can just call me Eric. You don't have to call me Professor. Um, you all know me anyway. So uh, I'm really excited to have um, uh, uh, this panel, uh, uh, I'll get the panelists just to say uh, one or two words about um, their uh, engagement with uh, reparations, uh, just to contextualize who they are and where they're coming from. Um, but just in general, our three panelists are um, national and international leaders in the reparations uh, movement right now. Um, we've got people who have testified um, before um, uh, the House Judiciary Committee, uh, Dreesen was there, uh, what was it, just last month, the month before. Um, uh, Justin has uh, organized and testified before the uh, Inter-American Commission on Humans. Um, and uh, DeMario is uh, engaged in one of the most uh, innovative lawsuits uh, seeking reparations in the country. So we're really lucky to have people who are um, uh, both talking the talk and walking the walk of uh, reparations uh, in the United States and internationally right now. So with that, uh, what I will do is I'll just hand it over. I, I'll go um, uh, Justin, Dreesen and DeMario. Uh, if you can uh, each uh, just say, um, in a couple of minutes, um, uh, a little bit about uh, what you're doing with reparations, how you got started in reparations, that would be really great. Justin, you wanna kick us off? Sure, um, well, thank, thank you all uh, for inviting me. Um, it's been some crazy times. <laughs> I, know I, I, um, I know that you may have heard even uh, yesterday, there was a vote in Evanston, Illinois um, on reparations that involved the um, city council uh, decision to devote, I believe it's 10 million to uh, uh, housing projects. And um, that was something that we were involved in at the Thurgood Marshall Center, uh, just trying to, trying to fight this fight because um, at the same at the same time as <laughs> as that vote was taking place, you may not have caught this, but there was a um, a letter written trying to at the last minute trying to uh, convince the Evanston City Council not to vote the way they did. Uh, the letter was written by a group called the Project on Fair Representation. Um, and uh, it was um, written by Edward Bloom, who is a conservative activist who um, very famously has opposed uh, lots of um, work on um, affirmative action over the years. Uh, if we open the chat, I can send you actually a link to all this debate and so people can get caught up on it. And the reason I raise it, raise it is for this reason. I think that a lot of us are struggling with how to discuss reparations in 2021 in a new way, in a way that is separate from traditional discourses around affirmative action and reparatory justice. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be around national repertory programs can be done more locally on a local basis. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways that it can be uh, provided. It can be provided through ca direct cash payments or it can be provided through institutional investments. So that, that these types of discussions are discussions 
that I've been having at Howard over the past uh, year as part of a group that we've we formed called the African American Redress Network, along with uh, Columbia University's Institute for Human for the Study of Human Rights. Really, does, really, our hope was to become something that uh, would be akin to an ALEC for reparations. Some of you may be, may be familiar with ALEC, which is this really uh, aggressive group that has been well known for providing logistical support and legal support and um, all types of uh, legislative support for private prison initiatives and other types of uh, problematic industries. We would like to do the same thing for reparations campaigns. If they're happening on a local level, state level, or even the federal level. So that, that work has been the, really the work that we've been engaged in over the last year. And um, I'm hoping to be able to talk about it with some of these wonderful attorneys. I'm really excited to be here. I know Dreesen very well, happy to see her again. And uh, it's, it's very great to meet you, um, Attorney DeMario, to also learn more about your work as well. So thanks for inviting me, Eric. Great, Dreesen, you wanna say a, a few words? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, thank you for um, <clears throat> being a part of this, this star-studded lineup over here. So I'm just uh, honored <laughs> to be in the space sharing it with you all. Um, yes, my name is Dreesen Heath. I am a uh, racial justice advocate and researcher at Human Rights Watch. Um, our mandate is international human rights law, which the right to remedy and reparation is well established. So my job really has been <clears throat> trying to educate the public on, um, you know, these the various forms of reparation um, through our advocacy and uh, at the federal level through House Resolution 40, a bill that has languished in Congress for 32 years, but has unprecedented support and momentum, um, you know, largely uh, a movement built by legacy reparations organizations, um, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, National African American Reparations Commission. Um, but we brought a unique um, <clears throat> advocacy um, muscle and research muscle to the space in order to galvanize other organizations who have been working on economic, social, cultural rights, racial justice issues, other inequities, um, and, you know, <laughs> providing space for them to contribute uh, towards um, advancements for the reparations for slavery. Um, I also, you know, my uh, dear colleague, uh, attorney o, uh, Solomon Simmons, um, I produced a report uh, last May 2020 ahead of the 99th mark of the Tulsa race massacre. Um, this is an issue that's near and dear to me. Uh, personal note, I uh, was born in Tulsa, though not a you know descendant of um, anyone who survived or was a victim of the massacre. But that report outlined um, the continual harm post uh, stemming from the massacre subsequent uh, racist policies uh, following the massacre, urban renewal, redlining, exclusionary zoning, uh, highway construction, and how that's perpetuated pervasive inequality um, and lesser conditions and quality of life for Black Tulsans, many of who are descendants um, of the massacre. Um, so examining these themes in the context of um, supporting uh, the national and local reparations movement in Tulsa. Fantastic. And so talking about Tulsa, uh, we have uh, attorney DeMario Solomon Simmons, uh, who is the lead counsel on um, Randall versus City of Tulsa, which is um, a lawsuit uh, being filed. It's being filed right now. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and your work with reparations, DeMario? Absolutely. First of all, just appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, Professor Miller, Eric, a good friend of mine, just thank you so much for your leadership and all everything you have done in the reparations space. Um, I've known Eric since I was in law school back in 2002, I think we first met when he was working on the Tulsa uh, litigation case at that time and got to spend a lot of time with him. And so I just appreciate you, appreciate the push that you're doing. And I'm just so glad we continue to push this work forward. 
I am excited to have an opportunity to once again talk about what we're doing here in Tulsa. I'm just a country attorney from North Tulsa, former football player. I didn't know, learn anything about Greenwood or the Tulsa massacre until I actually went to college. And I was sitting in class and a professor of mine was talking about Greenwood and Black Wall Street. And I raised my hand and said, you know, that's not true. I'm from Tulsa. I went to middle school on Greenwood Avenue. I've never heard this, it's not true. And obviously I have had the greatest shock of my life. And since that time, 1997, 98, I've been just obsessed with educating myself about Greenwood, educating others and advocating for Greenwood. I've had the opportunity to, uh, even the work I did with Eric was because I was the uh, uh, national reparations director for the National Black Law Student Association. I also did a lot of work with NCOBRA with HR 40 way back in the day. Uh, we hosted in 2005 after we lost our lawsuit to the Supreme Court in Tulsa. We hosted a national town hall which featured Professor Charles Ogletree and Representative Maxine Waters out of LA. And Eric, I'm sure you remember that. And of course, we worked to get the bill passed and had that hearing in 2007 uh, with Dr. John Ho Franklin and many of our survivors testifying, including Dr. Olivia Hooker. And so to be here again today, fighting this lawsuit, fighting this issue, fighting this injustice is invigorating. I always say we have not won yet, but because we're still fighting, we are winning. And that means that we still have a chance. So I'm just excited to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. And so um, I, I think there's two things that are raised by uh, the Tulsa litigation that it's worth uh, getting into. So I think there's a little bit of a debate um, uh, in the reparations world at the moment about, uh, um, I think it's been sparked a little bit by uh, um, Professor Sandy Darity's great great work with his uh, new book about whether reparations uh, ought to be only federal and national um, or, and whether uh, local reparations initiatives undermine that national uh, drive. Um, and uh, uh, related to that, I think, is uh, thinking about what reparations looks like. Is reparations just one big check um, or is it uh, is it more uh, targeted and more innovative uh, than that? So what does transformative justice look like? So um, uh, why don't we take the, um, uh, I mean, we can think about it nationally, locally, internationally. Um, why don't we start with um, uh, Dreesen? So what do you think? Do you think reparations uh, can be local? Should it be national? Where should we be looking to uh, place our energy for reparations? Yeah, it's a great question and it's a live question, right? Um, Justin mentioned uh, the effort in Evanston, um, which will, you know, focus on a localized harm 19, um, nine, from 1919 to 1969 discriminatory exclusionary zoning laws in Evanston um, impacted Black residents. And therefore, that's a specific remedy for a specific harm that was localized. Um, there needs to be that type of um, <clears throat> administering a remedy at the national, um, local, and institutional level. Um, we know that there were racist um, and <clears throat> oppressive federal policies, institution practices, but those were also implemented at the local, state, and institutional level, and therefore, um, you know, as defined in international um, human rights law and standards, these specific harms deserve specific remedies proportional to that harm. Um, there, there has to be more of an appetite to see um, reparative justice, to see reparations at these varying levels, because then how do you even get a holistic remedy for centuries of systemized harms? Um, <laughs> We can't, you know, the federal government has stalled on action for years, 150 years after they promised restitution. So we're, we're in a space where local um, governments and particularly religious institutions, universities, um, theological seminaries are taking steps in their own, um, you know, are taking their own steps to advance because their constituencies are speaking to the current harms and impacts of the legacy of slavery. Uh, we cannot escape the current conditions that are connected to this legacy. 
Um, and in order to advance racial justice, there's a necessary um, to have repair mechanisms or else you will not ever achieve um, what is equitable or what is um, you know, um, justice more broadly. So um, you know, I think we'll get into what, what that looks like, but I, I think we have to have an open imagination, but also um, less resistance to the idea that there is local action going on because the pro it has to start somewhere. Um, that does not negate the responsibility that the federal government has to account for its crimes. Thanks, Jason. So, Justin, uh, when I first met you, you were looking for reparations for the descendants of Marcus Garvey. Um, and, uh, you know, so you've been working on the international level uh, with Evanston, Illinois, on the local level. Uh, you um, were uh, heavily involved in seeking justice for the um, uh, Georgetown uh, descendants. Um, uh, so you've been involved at uh, and then, of course, with the, the um, uh, Inter-American Commission. And so you've been involved at, at all these levels. Um, is, is there something uh, that different that you're looking e each for each time, or is it the same sort of um, uh, uh, reparation strategy that you're, you're, you're doing each time? When I... I, well, I would just, first of all, I just wanted to just agree with Dreesen, Dreesen's comments. I don't think that the idea that a local strategy in some way, shape, or form uh, is a mutually exclusive strategy from a national strategy or even an international strategy, I don't think there's sound logic behind that reasoning. The, the only logic I can think of is this idea that um, People will feel like if you, uh, you know, if you get one, you shouldn't get the other, or something like that. But that's not really, it's not that's not logical to feel like you're the rep. You, you, there's a some sort of repair that will be enough to close off any sort of further discussion about the loss of lives, the, the destruction of lives, the the expropriation of of labor, and really the the, the construction of identities that then get exploited for profit, in, if you think about racial capitalism. So the, really the construction of that sort of ext extraction mechanism is one that took place on the local, national, and international level. And a logic that states that you can, if you get something, some sort of repair on the local level, then the national and, and international one is sort of canceled out. It's not logical. And it's unfortunate that that that's, that's something that has been promulgated by Professor Darity and others. For me, my experience has been, whether on the local, national, or international level, you're always, you're always in a situation where you're trying to create a, um, a, a program of repair that speaks to the particular harm that was done. And it's, it's really not, it's, and I'll be honest, my perspective is, it's almost impossible to do that without having a local lens. Even if we, if we are working on a national or international level, what we're doing on those national or international platforms is explaining what happened locally and trying to, to argue that from a cumulative perspective, those multiple local struggles should be addressed by a national program. But there's no, there's, there's, the strategy that I'm perhaps most invested in right now is the local one, because I believe that my, my vision of a perfect reparations movement will be one of a thousand local reparations campaigns that become successful. Because what that does is allows people who were most closely related to the mm -hmm. crisis, most closely related to the atrocity to have their story told and to tell the story in their own terms. The direct descendants can be able to, to speak and, they, and there's not enough room on, you know, one in one bill or on one national platform for all of those local people to speak. They have to be able to participate and being able to uh, dig into their own histories and find justice. They have to be able to participate 
in a robust way. And you can't do that in one hearing on the international level. And I'm not saying that throwing shade to Driesen, who has been at the national federal hearings and has done a great job on that. But, but she can tell you more than anyone else, you know, the Evanston story, the Tulsa story, the Garvey story, there, you know, there are only four or five speakers. There's only a couple of hours. You can't truly uh, uh, mine and find some way to do the archeology span on all, everything that happened in those short and those very small platforms. So I'm deeply committed to the local strategy right now because I think that's the best strategy for us to really get some measure of repair. So Demario, one thing that really strikes me about your uh, litigation in uh, Tulsa is um, uh, that even though it's it's focused on, on one locality, uh, Tulsa um, rather than Evanston, uh, your lawsuit um, shows uh, that there are uh, multiple um, events that require reparations. So the um, the um, shockwaves from the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, in which um, 8,000 people were rendered homeless overnight, um, uh, 35 city blocks burned to the ground. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how um, the the uh, city and other um, public and private actors um, were involved in that and, and how um, just in that one location we could file multiple reparations lawsuits over a whole period of time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely want to talk about that continuing harm. I do want to say first though, that you know, when it comes to reparations, particularly anything for black folks, people just always want to make it so complicated. So our adversary, as Professor uh, Hansford was Justin was just saying, oh, you can only get one or the other. Like it's just a basic tort fees uh, analysis. If two people injure someone, both the people that injured them are responsible for the repair, for the remedy. It's not, it's really not rocket science. When it comes to us, it's like, oh my God, this is taken away from here and there. So I totally agree with what Dreeson and, and um, Justin is saying. We want to fight on all fronts, on all levels, as much as possible we can and, and, and find victories. And this is why I think Tulsa is so important. I think it's so important because we have, for two reasons. Number one, you have a very specific injury to a very specific group of people. You know who did it and you know what was lost. And so if you cannot win reparations in this scenario, where can you win it, right? Where can you be successful if you cannot be successful for the most prosperous black community in the nation being burnt down? And you're not just saying that like out in the open, it's like, no, we know J.B. Stratford had the largest black owned hotel in America. It was burnt down. We know that the Dreamland Theater was the most luxurious uh, black theater in America, it was burnt down. We know that A.J. Smitherman owned the Tulsa Star, which was considered the first black newspaper to have a weekly circulation. Like we know what was lost. We know these people submitted insurance claims of $4 million and 1921 dollars. And we know who these people are. So we don't have to do a whole bunch of research to figure out what was lost and who does it needs to be made whole. So I think that makes Tulsa very important. Also, I think because of the hundred years of continuing harm that you ask about, Eric, that we can show a specific line that if Tulsa, the massacre would not have happened, then maybe the Klan couldn't have built the largest ever, the largest Ku Klux Klan meeting ground in Greenwood in 1923. If 1921 had happened, maybe to, uh, the Greenwood area would not have been without paved roads and proper running water up until the 1950s. If the massacre hadn't happened, maybe the city of Tulsa wouldn't have had the political uh, and wealth to be able to political capital and the wealth to just take the highway I-244 right, right through Greenwood, further cementing the, the death of Black Wall Street and kicking all our people out north where I grew up. If the massacre hadn't happened, maybe Terrence Crutcher is not shot with his hands up in the air as he's walking away from uh, Betty Shelby because the, United, the Tulsa public, Tulsa Police Department has such a history of brutality that started because of the massacre. I mean, specifically, they stated publicly in papers and in um, governmental documents, we never want to allow quote unquote nigger town 
to prosper like that again. And one way we're gonna do that is to aggressively and over police them. That aggressive and over policing continues to this day. The fact that in 1921, blacks owned their houses at the same rate as white Tulsans. Now they are two times as likely to own a house, white Tulsans and black Tulsans. Or today, black Tulsans live an average of 11 or 14 years less than white Tulsans. All of that is a direct line from the massacre. The last thing I'll say about that, there is no disputing that. Even our mayor who is, a, who is against us 100%, who is against reparations, who's against justice, he has to admit that the, in, the inequalities that we experience here in the black community in Tulsa is a direct result. This is his words, not mine, of the 1921 race massacre. Thanks, uh, Demario. So um, I, I'm going to stick with you just uh, for a moment because uh, one of the things that's really remarkable about uh, your lawsuit, which is um, you keep saying my lawsuit, you my co-counsel. <laughs> I answer to you, Demario. You say jump, I say hi. hi. Um, uh, one of the the great things about our lawsuit is that. Um, uh, is, is the way in which uh, it um, is based in public nuisance and therefore frames um, remedies in a different way, in a more community-oriented uh, way than uh, a traditional uh, constitutional tort lawsuit, a Section 1983 lawsuit um, would do. So the, the standard uh, knock and reparations has been that it's just a... a a check to um, to individuals. Uh, it's a one-time payment, and uh, we're done. So um, I know all the panelists have have used this, but I thought I'd start with you since you've um, got this in uh, the lawsuit. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what the sort of transformational justice uh, that we're seeking through reparations looks like on the ground? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because we spent, as you know, Eric, uh, over a year researching our petition. And, and I mean, we probably had 50 drafts of petitions and thinking about remedies. And it was very important for us to include uh, in our remedies section, uh, an opportunity a victim's compensation fund. Uh, so people that lost uh, property, who made those claims that we know that they should be repaid. We don't run away from the fact that reparations should include a check. In fact, I have a hashtag, cut the check. Cut the talking and cut the check. But it's so much more than that, as you stated, Eric. I mean, we talk about wanting to make sure that the 40, 36 to 40 blocks of Greenwood that was black owned, that's now down to half a block. We're saying, look, that's not right. We want a land audit. We want to understand who owns this land. How did they get it? And give this land back to the rightful owners. And if, you, if it's impractical to give them the actual land, pay them the fair market value of the land. We want scholarships for descendants. And so they can actually take advantage of the, they would have been educated. They would have had opportunities to go and come back to Tulsa. So now we have such a brain drain of black professionals in Tulsa because no one wants to be here. But it wouldn't have been that way if Tulsa would have continued to be the center, the Mecca of black America. I mean, most people, when I tell them I'm from Oklahoma, they say, I didn't even know even black people lived there. And that really hurts me because we were such a black place of black excellence, but that legacy was stolen from us. We're asking for things like a, a hospital. We have no hospital in North Tulsa. We have, we are a food desert. So we're talking about all of these holistic things. We're also asking for specific monies for emotional and mental trauma. We know, we've known this forever, but now the science proves that generational trauma lives through our, our, our bodies and in our homes and in our DNA. And this is impacting our people daily. One of our clients is a hundred, well, we have two 106 year old clients and they both will tell you that they think about what happened to them in their community every single day, every single day. And so all of that is part of the repair. And in our lawsuit, we specifically, we don't even use the word reparations one time. We said we want respect, restoration and repair. Now you can drill that down into reparations, but that is what we're calling it. It's a basic tenet of basic ju jurisprudence in America. But again, when it comes to black folks, it's like, oh man, we gotta 
Pythagorean theorem or something. No, this is very simple. You harmed us, you're responsible to, to pay the damages. Thanks, um, uh, Demario. So on this question of, of transformational uh, justice, um, uh, Justin, uh, what do you think? What does reparations look like on the ground to you? Well, I think, I think for me, I also um, am not one of those folks who says reparations has to be only direct payments. I, I agree with uh, Attorney Demario. I think that uh, that includes a number of different methods through which those um, resources can be given to the community. If you look at the uh, United Nations uh, framework for what they see as reparations, and um, once, once again, once I, I tend to, when I do these things, I love to send out links to, so people can see some of these things. So once we get that set up, um, I'll show it to you. But we have a website called the US African American Redress Network. And part of the website's um, purpose is to help to educate people about the United Nations view that in order for there to be a full repertory justice framework, uh, it demands more than simply handing over some cash. The traditional reparations framework includes guarantees of non-repetition and, and guaranteeing that you won't do it again. It includes rehabilitation. So as Mara was saying, mental health services, psychological health services for those who are directly impacted and those descendants who are still uh, going through the process of healing from that trauma. Um, it includes uh, compensation, but also uh, things like apologies and other commemorations of what happened, uh, public apologies, memorials, museums, public education. Um, those, are, those are the types of things that are all part of a reparations package. So you think about the work that we did with Marcus Garvey, you know, we were asking in that context for a posthumous pardon to exonerate Marcus Garvey for the wrongful conviction that also took place oddly in, in 1923. There was a lot of things happening at that time. Um, and he was someone who's of course our, you know, probably our, one of our most successful African-American human rights activists. And uh, he was framed by J. Edgar Hoover and deported in, in 19, uh, 23, the deportation happened shortly thereafter. Um, and that is a stain on his legacy. It is something that has continued to uh, uh, bring hurt and pain to his family and to people around the country and around the world to clear his name would be something that is the right thing to do. And that, that would be something that could also lead to other types of efforts in terms of non-repetition to make sure we don't continue the legacy of surveilling and wrongfully prosecuting African-American human rights activists. We've seen that even with Black Lives Matter. So this idea that uh, just a cash payment to the Garvey family or a cash payment to the descendants in Tulsa, that's what reparations is, full stop. That's enough, that's all it is. Anything else is, is not useful or not helpful. I think that's an incomplete understanding of what rep repertory justice looks like. And we've seen, again, the good thing about reparations as a framework in an international context and what, in, you know, Eric is someone who was uh, able to testify before the Inter-American Commission on reparations about, I guess that was a year and a half ago, Eric. And the good thing about that experience is that we, we see reparations being given to people all over the world all the time. You see, it's not just an Germany after the Holocaust, but you think think about, you know, in South America, in, in Argentina after Pinochet, you've got situations happening. You know, of course, you think about South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There are all these different precedents where, where folks have engaged with these legacies of atrocities, and they have done memorials, and they have given apologies, and they have given money, and they have guaranteed non-repetition in different ways. And all of that has been helpful. All of that has been useful. Those memorials mean something to the people who are descendants in those, um, in those places. 
those those guarantees of repetition of non repetition mean something. So um, I, I I have adopted that holistic view of reparations myself. I don't believe that reparations starts and ends with a financial cash dip, uh, dispensation. I think it includes that, but I think it is uh, an impoverished view of reparations to think that that's all that it it, it, um, it includes. Sorry, I was on mute. So thanks, uh, Justin. So um, I'm gonna ask the same question to Dreesen and uh, just to let uh, folks know, um, the chat is open. So while uh, uh, we're speaking with Dreesen, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I'll select some and ask um, the panelists, but uh, Dreesen, what, is, what does uh, transformational justice and reparations look like to you? Yeah, like Justin, I've been supportive and um, will ab continue to advocate on holistic remedy. Um, you know, what's what's a what's special about the process of reparation, which is separate from the government's, um, you know, uh, responsibility to provide public policy measures or um, measures that meet people's everyday needs, um, development and aid efforts. Um, <clears throat> Black communities have historically been disinvested in in the United States. So there needs to be increased investments in the community for basic day-to-day -day needs and also repair measures um, that administer remedies for past and ongoing harms. Um, within the context, you know, a lot of things have come up already, guarantees of non-repetition. How do we ensure um, you know, institutional reforms? We really have to interrogate the criminal legal system and policing systems as they exist today. They were built up to surveil, profile, um, and suppress Black bodies. Um, we have still an um, exception through the 13th Amendment uh, for slavery and forced labor, forced labor but for um, you know, exception of a, of a crime, punishment of a crime. Um, we continue to have a policing system, um, you know, that racially targets um, not only kills Black people at high rates, but also, um, you know, everyday police abuse, um, you know, stop and frisk, um, uh, stopping uh, traffic stops, um, you know, no knock uh, warrants, all, all of those um, measures need to be examined as well as legal reform. Um, past uh, it, um, claims by descendants of enslaved Africans um, in the courts, you know, are thrown out by statute of limitations or other uh, uh, legal barriers, um, as well as decisions that maybe this claim is too political and needs to be handled outside of a judicial remedy. Um, these are barriers to access uh, for judicial remedy accountability possibly criminal prosecutions. Um, I think we really, in addition to that, need to interrogate um, uh, land possession in, in, in um, housing. Um, this really determines, uh, where you live determines so many other your equality indicators. Um, we have, you know, post the dis um, you know, mass land theft and genocide of indigenous and native people, you have the Homestead Act doling out over 270 million acres of land to mostly white people. Today, that land is owned, 98% of rural land is owned by white people. Um, that means that farmers that own millions of acres of land and black farmers that own millions of acres of land in early 1900s were dispossessed of almost 95% of that land. Um, we have to have a conversation about that. We have to have a conversation about housing measures. Um, in addition to what has already been said, I would just emphasize um, ec economic development efforts that are targeted, capital measures that are targeted to ensure, um, you know, uh, things like um, uh, eradicating discriminatory lending and other barriers to capital um, and, and intergenerational wealth. Um, targeting investments that really um, interrogate what specific harms um, have been experienced in a community and really just emphasizing the trauma-informed care piece. 
uh, we have intergenerational trauma uh, that continues to manifest itself in so many different ways. We have cities and, and, and states declaring racism as a public health crisis, but systemic racism, racism has had health um, you know, consequences on Black people, premature aging, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other um, uh, poor health outcomes, including um, you know, uh, lower life expectancy rates. So all, all, of, all of these options in the holistic remedy that's outlined by international standards need to be on the table. Um, there shouldn't be an exclusion of any remedy, especially for the harms uh, related to the legacy of slavery. And one last point, because um, Justin brought up pardons, you know, the Civil Liberties Act, which granted redress to Japanese Americans, um, granted not only financial compensation, education benefits, but also pardon for wartime detention um, crimes that um, Japanese um, Americans were incarcerated for, for resisting detention. We still have, you know, Black Panthers um, in prison right now. We still have um, uh, survivors of um, Chicago police torture in prison right now. So how do we begin to have those conversations of, of expungement of records related to the war on drugs, as well as, you know, um, uh, um, you know uh, waiving criminal convictions and, and administering pardons for um, Black political activity in the U.S.? Yeah, I got my, uh, my start. Um, I was in the uh, Harvard Balsa. Um, as their political action committee co-chair, uh, getting a student uh, campaign writing to uh, uh, political prisoners, um, you know, Black Panthers in prison. And um, some of the reparations work that I was researching a while ago was, was actually seeing if we could um, file key TAM actions in Alabama to expunge the convict leasing uh, records of um, uh, of uh, formerly incarcerated um, uh, people, uh, including um, uh, people who, who had been deceased, because I, I you know, I, I think there's that changes the narrative of black criminality that dominates a lot of what is uh, driving our current uh, political system. But uh, uh, I shouldn't really be tooting my horn. I, I need to toot all of your horns, and we've got some questions in the uh, chat. So. Um, so why don't we begin um, uh, with uh, uh, this question. Uh, we've got three questions in, in the chat so far, so we'll try and keep it, the answers uh, reasonably short. How about this for DeMario? Uh, how um, are the claims in the Tulsa case conceived? Do they include claims for both personal injury and property unjust enrichment? What else you got in there? Well, we have two main claims, which is the public <laughs> nuisance and then we do have unjust enrichment. And within the public nuisance sphere, we're actually following the, the blueprint that the state of Oklahoma successfully used uh, to win a $546 million verdict against Johnson and Johnson, Johnson, and Johnson for opioid um, abuse. And so it's the, same, it's the same law, it's the same logic that Johnson and Johnson for 40 years flooded the market utilizing their, their resources and their, and their wealth and their activities to create this opioid crisis in the, in the state of Oklahoma. We're making the same argument that the massacre uh, to flooded the market with all type of discriminatory actions and red line and discrimination, blah, 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 as we talk about. And that's part of the both for individuals with the victim's compensation, but also as a community it destroyed the entire community. As far as unjust enrichment, we're specifically talking about, I'm so glad this question came up. We're talking about the city and its benefactors utilizing the massacre as a uh, publicity stunt and a way to build and, and, and raise money in the brand of Black Wall Street. They actually call it cultural tourism. They have an entity called the Tulsa Race Massacre Commission, which is a sham entity. It's nothing but a whitewashing of the city's role and the chamber's role into the destruction of Black Wall Street. And to utilize that to bring in money to downtown white-owned businesses and white-owned uh, business interests. 
And so we think that's unjust. And we don't believe that the same people that destroy the community are literally stepping on the backs and the bones and the blood of those they kill to say, look at us, look how great we are now. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, they paid and bought a full page ad in the USA Today falsely claiming that Tulsa, Oklahoma was leading the nation in America's racial healing. It's a farce, it's absurd, it's unconscionable. And so that's why we believe the unjust enrichment claim is viable. Thanks, uh, DeMario. Um, so uh, another question is, um, uh, we can ask uh, maybe Justin and Dreesen, uh, what can students or new lawyers do in a volunteer capacity to support this work? DeMario would say go to the Justice for Greenwood webpage. You already know what I was thinking, justiceforgreenwood.org. <laughs> Put it in the chat, uh, DeMario. Okay. <laughs> Justin, what do you think? Well, you know, also, I'm also going to plug mine. One, one of the things that we have uh, been really excited about at the Redress Network is a mapping project that we created. I'm going to put that mapping project in the chat. And what, we've, what we're trying to do is create a map of all of the, the local reparations campaigns happening all around the country. Uh, you, if you click on that link, you'll see we've mapped a good number of the campaigns in the Southeast. Uh, you see the, they, they continue to grow. Um, uh, brother put a, a link to Evanston in there. They know that's something that we need to add uh, now after this vote. So we, if, we would love to have more students volunteer to help us identify local reparations campaigns that may be under the radar some of these states that are not yet touched on our map here, you know, we've got Texas and, you know, we've got Missouri and we haven't made, made it far out to the West Coast yet. But there, there, there are lots of things happening on a local level that don't get enough attention. That's one of the things that we're most uh, concerned about doing is raising awareness about those local campaigns and then helping get, to get resources to those local campaigns. So if anyone is interested in doing something, if they have some time to contribute, a simple Google search of reparations campaigns that may be happening under the radar, or if you want to connect with me or connect with um, us and, and work with a, a group of interns, we have about 10 interns working on this right now. So folks may want to do some research on that. That would be one helpful way to start to contribute in the short term. Recent, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I mean, I'd also like to plug justiceforgreenwood.org. Um, please go there if you are not there already. Um, I would also, at the federal level with HR 40, you know, this is a live bill. Um, this bill has never been voted out of Judiciary Committee, is poised to receive a vote in the coming weeks. Um, HR 40 advocates have been working tirelessly. Um, to advance this bill. Uh, we've uh, <clears throat> garnered a uh, great uh, broad coalition of organizations, over 300 organizations who are invested um, in this type of work and wanna support it. Uh, we, we really want to um, see other organizations join this fight to um, push forward to advance HR 40 out of Judiciary Committee and then on to the House floor. Obviously, we have a, um, you know, political jungle in the Senate, uh, but we also have a concurrent uh, strategy uh, with the White House and in, in, um, calling for an executive order uh, to establish the HR 40 Commission um, by the administration. So um, there's definitely ways to plug in. Um, HRW.org backslash reparations now is also a place to plug in. Um, looking at, you know, in Cobra's website, NARC's website, um, but getting in touch with me as we're, we're building out, um, we have a, you know, we've been building out legislative outreach as well as our communications outreach. A lot of the the uh, talk around HR 40 is, is, is um, you know, generated by this HR 40 coalition. And we've been able to shift the media narrative in the place that 
you know, ha presents a better understanding of these issues in, in a present day context um, that doesn't allow people to dismiss, you know, slavery as 150 years ago. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about the present day impacts as well as the past, um, you know, harms, but really emphasizing messaging wise, um, <clears throat> what reparation is, what it will entail um, and how, um, you know, how to go about that process at the federal level and then how, um, you know, to support these local efforts. So um, anyone wanting to get plugged in on HR 40, S40, uh, please reach out. Yes, and I, I also want to make sure to plug um, our state uh, reparation statute that just um, got passed, uh, AB uh, 3121. Um, uh, the, in June of this year, the committee is going to be announced. Um, the committee is, is looking into, among other things, recommending uh, remedies. And so um, it would be great that would be a great opportunity for students to get involved. I'm sure that committee is going to need some research uh, help as well. Um, we're almost uh, out of time. Um, I just want to, um, so, so one thing I'll quickly do, and then I'll just uh, ask the panelists if they have uh, any last comments. Um, we're going to, um, so, so one th other thing students can do is, uh, ask your professors to teach reparations. When I started teaching, I did a little, um, actually it was an overload class. Uh, I was young and energetic and foolish and didn't get paid for it, but did a two credit class for um, uh, looking into reparations actually in New England. And one place we identified was Malaga, Maine, and there's still some work to be done uh, uh, there. If folks are interested, just email me, I can tell you uh, what went down. Um, uh, for Loyola, um, we're going to keep building on this reparations discussion. Uh, the um, uh, Loyola Anti-Racism -Race Center and our uh, Policing Los Angeles Forum uh, are going to have a discussion on uh, policing reparations and reconciliation on April 26th. Um, we're still getting that panel together, but uh, we'll announce um, the panelists uh, shortly. Uh, with that, I just want to um, uh, give our panelists just a chance for uh, closing uh, remarks. Why don't we um, uh, start with DeMario, then uh, Justin, and finish with Dreesen. I just want to say thank you again for inviting me with this great panel. Uh, Eric, I just appreciate you. I hope the students realize how much of a great asset you are at Loyola as one of the foremost experts in reparations. And I just thank everybody for your support. Please pray for our survivors. We have three living survivors, two 106, one will be 107 Viola Fletcher on May 10th. And we have 100 year old uncle, we call him Uncle Red, Hugh Van Ellis. And lastly, I just wanna recognize, I see my, my partner, Dr. Tiffany Crutcher is in this chat. I appreciate her always supporting our work. She's here in Tulsa. And I just thank everyone for your time today. Justin, you're on mute. Is there a way we can? There we or go. Just... All right. There we go. I'm unmuted now. So no, I think thank you all for inviting me. Thank you, Eric, for your work. It's great to meet you, uh, Demario and Dreesen. I, 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 the only thing I'd like to close with is that what a wonderful time to be alive, right? I mean. Reparations is something that people have been calling for for centuries, and we've seen more uh, victories on reparations in the last two years than we probably saw in the last hundred. And uh, we're only going to go up from here. So let's join, just join forces in this historic movement and really take advantage of the moment that we're in. And reason. Yes, I echo those words, um, taking advantage of today. We're in a very unique um, scenario, though we're in a polarized political arena. Um, we're still in a unique um, scenario to advance towards repair. I would just emphasize that if you are doing racial justice work, you should be 
contributing to the reparations movement. You should be working on reparations. Um, in order to achieve racial justice, there has to be methods of repair or else you will not be able to achieve equity or justice. So um, please institute um, reparative justice into your framework of racial justice um, work moving forward um, and support at the local and um, uh, state and federal level. There's a lot going on um, and you can also start your um, movement today um, in consultation with other community members. We've seen how the grassroots, some of the grassroots um, local efforts, I'm thinking of Amherst, Massachusetts, um, for instance, you know, has just unearthed with people um, caring about <clears throat> dealing with these issues head on. Um, and you know, um, looking to see uh, a pathway to repair. So you have the power to to do what you need to do, and um, you know, let's advance this forward. Thank you, everyone, so much. Kathleen, do you have any uh, last words you'd like to say? Um, I just want to thank everyone. I, I, I put it in the chat. Um, thank you to our esteemed speakers. Thank you to Eric Miller for putting this program together. Lark definitely wants to support and help. I'm sure we have students um, it, it, that attended today that, um, that want to um, follow up on all the ideas that, that you all shared. So, um, so we will, we'll, we'll be following up and, um, and, and we want to support, um, all, again, all the suggestions, all the efforts that, that you've already spearheaded. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. This was a fantastic. I'm teaching torts now, by the way. So <laughs> I just made that comment because <laughs> the, the tort strategies and the reparations lawsuits. Thank you, everyone. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you so much. Great job. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much.